enlist in the Civil War. The Revolution of 1848 brought a large number of German immigrants to America. Nearly a million new German immigrants, men, women, and children, had arrived during the decade uh, after the Revolution. Uh, they were either a part of the Revolution in the Civil War than any other immigrant group. Approximately 216,000 joined the Union forces. Why did so many people come from a foreign land to risk life and limb in a war? In a war that did not affect their homeland and was caused by conditions from before their arrival. There were a variety of factors that influenced their decision. We'll look at, look at a number of them in turn. <clears throat> First, the 48ers were influenced by their ideals. The revolutionists, as they called themselves, advocated liberal ideas. They included uh, the, uh, the, excuse me, they included civil rights, universal suffrage, representative government, a centralized nation, and economic and social and educational opportunities for the individual. One must be careful when looking at these goals, however. They were progressive for the time, but they uh, do not necessarily have the same meanings that we ascribe to them today. A centralized government does not seem to be so controversial today, but in the remnants of the Holy Roman Empire, each local despot wanted desperately to hold on to power. The concept of the universal suffrage, even in the United States at that time, meant white male property suffrage. The 1848ers were strong supporters of public education, and many of them were educators. But it was a new concept at that time. Uh, most of the 48ers disliked the institution of slavery, partly because it was akin to the serf system that they detested. However, the concept of civil rights did not always go as far as racial equality. Uh, most of Europe was an agrarian economy which had limited pro productivity as it was emerging from the Little Ice Age. The Industrial Revolution was coming, but many people felt they were being left behind economically. Many were, benefiting, uh, were not benefiting from the new system and were unable to support themselves from the old order. And new opportunities in a new country were appealing. Many of the European liberal ideas at the time were also present in America. The Union favored industrialization, immigration, civil rights, tariffs, expansion west, education, economic opportunity, and an open society. In contrast, the Confederacy advocated decentralization, states' rights, limited travel, slavery, isolated agriculture, uh, controlled expansion, and an elitist and controlling plantation system. Secondly, the uh, 48ers were shaped by their experiences. <clears throat> Fighting for a cause was not new to the 48ers. They'd been conditioned to become involved in the political actions of the times. The, uh, the movement uh, for social, political, and economic freedom had been building for years in Europe. In Western Europe, gains had been made over through the years. Uh, but the conservative governments in Central Europe and Russia were often were attempting to resist the growing wave of unrest. Preliminary events that happened in the Humbucker Fest in 1832 and in the Rhineland in 1840. Then uh, in February of 1848, a resolution demanding a Bill of Rights passed, the Mannheim, it passed in Mannheim-Baden. Similar re resolutions were adopted in other German states. The March Fort Röntgen, the demands of March, uh, first <clears throat> met with minimal resistance. However, later the conservative governments began, began to strongly resist the protesters and use military force to hold them in line. The liberal protesters gained much in early 1848. However, the tide turned against them, and by 1949, they lost many of the gains they had made. Their experiences radicalized and activated many of the 1848ers, and they carried these impulses to America. Third, the 1848ers' organizations influenced their actions. 1848 refugees were strongly influenced by, the by their organizations. Some of these groups in turn included the Turner Societies, the Sons of Hermann, political clubs such as the Friedermannverein, and local groups such as the Liederkranz and Schutzenvereins, and many more. Uh, the Turner uh, Vereins were the best known of the organization. The Turners stressed physical fitness and grew to include cultural activities such as musical and dramatic performances. As the unrest with the political system developed, the Turner Societies also became centers for critical thought and activism. When the revolution of 1848 failed, the refugees brought their organizations to America. The first Turner Verein in America was in Cincinnati and organized by Friedrich Heckler in 1848. 
In America, the Turnverein's took on an additional role of being in a support group for the immigrants in a new and strange country. It was a touch of home and a place where they could learn how their new society functioned. It was still a forum for liberal ideas and a planning base for actions. Uh, the other uh, larger organizations were the uh, Sons of Hermann, and there were also uh, groups like the Liederkranz Musical Groups, the Schützenverein Shooting Clubs, and many others, including some that were strictly political groups and others that were quasi-militarily. One of such of uh, these organizations was the Friedermannverein. Uh, in uh, their, these organizations, the 1848 refugees learned to appreciate the freedoms and openness of their new country and found ways to express their beliefs. Fourth, the reaction to prejudice was a serious consideration. There were uh, Germans in America from the early colonial days, but their numbers, as their numbers increased, so did discrimination. By 1840, the Sons of Hermann Society was organized with one of its principal purposes to specifically combat prejudice. Nativism was the dominant type of discrimination faced by many of the, of the immigrants. The idea was that the native born were, had a superior claim to dominate a culture. In the 1840s, nativism became a national political movement. Its secretive nation, nature led them to claim to know nothing. The Know Nothings movement had subdivisions such as the Order of, the, of United Americans and the Order of the Star Spangled Banner. In the, in public, <clears throat> its public face was the political party, the Native American Party. It strove to curb immigration and naturalization. The movement reached its peak about 1854 to 1856, after which the Know Nothing splintered into multiple groups, as did the major political parties at the time. But many types of discrim discrimination continued. <clears throat> For Germans, the struggle to save the Union was also a fight to gain acceptance in a predominantly Anglo-American population. Fifth. There were strong leaders from the Revolution of 1848. The Revolution brought forth a number of seasoned and able leaders. Many of them immigrated to America and offered their services and experience to the Union. These men were highly regarded by the immigrants who were familiar with their exploits in Germany. Large numbers of immigrants enlisted to be able to stand and fight with these heroes of the Revolution of 1848. Some of the more prominent ones included Franz Siegel, Karl Schurz, the five generals from the Solomon family, Alexander Schimmelfen, the Prussian officer who changed sides and immigrated under a death penalty. There are many more whose exploits and leadership influenced the immigrants to enlist. One of the popular songs among the immigrants was I Goes to Fight Mit Siegel. The 48ers were not uh, fighting as Germans, nor normally did they have specialized insignia. They were fighting as Americans and uh, for the Union and for the ideals it represented. At least 68 of them became Medal of Honor recipients. Sixth, the strong recruiting efforts influenced many of the immigrants. In the, uh, <clears throat> an increasingly large number of troops were required as the war progressed, and it became more difficult to get the numbers needed. A draft was imposed not so much to raise troops directly as it was to encourage enlistment. Uh, many states and localities responded by also offering cash bonuses. German immigrants saw the Civil War as an extension of a long historical fight for personal liberty. They enlisted uh, in, in, excuse me, they enlisted in local recruiting stations throughout the North and were present in nearly every military unit. There were some centers where the German recruitment was especially strong, such as in the Turnerverein's. Some of these organizations were so effective at recruiting that they depleted their own membership to the place where they had to close down until after the war. Uh, recruiters also made strong efforts to recruit newly arrived immigrants as soon as they stepped on American soil. Many immigrants, uh, immigrant processing centers like Castle Gardens in Manhattan Island had major recruiting efforts. Misha Honick, the contemporary German scholar, said the draft actually dropped the morale in some of the uh, 1848ers. Uh, to them, conscription involved shades of slavery and would impinge upon their concept of martial manhood. But the Im immediacy of the military necessity overrode such misgivings. Seventh, the Southern experience was a contrast to the Northern conditions. Not all of the German immigrants were in the Northern states or fought for the Union. 
About 5% of the total German population in America lived in the slave states. Approximately 2,000 Germans enlisted and another 3,000 were drafted into the Confederate ranks. The highest ranking German officers in the Confederacy were General John Wagner of the German, <clears throat> German Fusiliers and Jeb Stewart's aide, Major Johann von Burkel. Others included uh, Colonel August Buchel of the 1st Texas uh, Cavalry Regiment and uh, many other lesser officers. The Germans <coughs> in the South were of mixed opinion about the Confederate cause. There were some German slave owners and blockade runners in a number of southern cities. The largest uh, <coughs> southern communities, southern, uh, largest German community in, uh, were in Texas. Um, the attitudes there uh, first became to public attention at the annual Strass Singerfest in San Antonio in 1854. A mildly worded plank proposed that slavery should be abolished by having the federal government pay to free slaves. Uh, but the San, Anto San Antonio Zuchtag took an even more strident anti-slavery uh, anti stance in its editorials. The Anglo-Texans uh, feared that the Germans would support the Union cause. Their suspicious seem suspicions seemed concern confirmed when 65 Union sympathizers from Western Texas left for Mexico. Martial, art was, uh, <clears throat> martial law was declared and the military pursued and attacked them and on August 10, 1862, killed 34. It became known as the Neches Massacre. In 1863, another 800 men in arms resistance to the state draft. Again, martial law was declared and the ringleaders were arrested and jailed whereupon the rest yielded. The pro-Confederacy sentiment in most areas was so strong that any kind of resistance would have been futile. <clears throat> Eighth, an abbreviated path to citizenship was valued. The Civil War offered an opportunity for many immigrants to attain citizenship in a more abbreviated fashion. The first national naturalization law was passed in 1790 requiring two years residency. A few years later, the Reactionary Alien and Sedition Acts raised the restriction to 14 years. Soon uh, a more rational <clears throat> environment prevailed and the restriction was lowered to five years under President Thomas Jefferson. These restrictions stayed at this level for many years. The state still had, had an influence on many of the other provisions. To encourage immigrant enlistment, Congress passed the Act of July 17, 1862 that provided a Union soldier upon being honorably discharged could apply for citizenship without, declaring, without a declaration of intention and requiring no more than one year residency. Naturalization was often granted in mass as the units were discharged. As a result, genealogists sometimes have difficulty locating naturalization documents. Ninth, there were financial incentives to join the army. Many of the refugees from, of the Revolution of 1848 left their homeland under duress, and even those that were financially well off were not able to, to take many of their assets with them. As a result, financial incentives were a consideration by many enlistees. The uh, call for volunteers for the Civil War was made by the federal government, but it was administered by the states. Each state was given a quota to fulfill. The practice was to offer a bounty to help achieve these goals. Each state set its own standards of what to offer, but for the times, they were quite generous. The uh, wage for a common laborer at the time was in the area of $300 a year. Many states offered $100 to $300 bounty for enlisting, depending on when and where a soldier enlisted, he could collect a sign-up bonus, military pay, and service bounty from state, county, and federal sources that could range up to $1,000, or about three years working class wage. In some areas, immigration costs were also rebated. To an immigrant, the promise of a quick route to citizenship and a nest egg to start a new life were strong incentives to enlist in the Union Army. In conclusion, I would like to relay the stories of two of my ancestors and their very different experiences during these times. Both are my great-grandfathers and both were too young to have participated in the Revolution of 1848, but they were children growing up at the time. They would have heard and seen many of the events that surrounded the Revolution. 
John Daedler Shore was born in Elbertsdorf, a small town east of Meldorf in the Dittmarschen area of Schleswig-Holstein. He immigrated to America and settled in New Holstein, Wisconsin, in an area known as the Latin Farmers. A large number of highly educated farmers lived in the area, many of whom were fluent in the Latin language. It was clearly a refuge for many of the 48ers. He wanted to establish himself but did not have the funds and wages accumulated slowly. Other opportunities uh, were unavailable without citizenship. Then he heard the military uh, service could lead to a quicker route to naturalization and there were significant cash bonuses. Being young and adventurous and influenced by his 1848er neighbors, he decided to enlist in the 4th Wisconsin Cavalry. His unit was sent to Louisiana to hold the Mississippi River right after General Grant had taken it for the Union. He saw action in a number of skirmishes. He had risen rapidly from uh, rank of private to corporal to sergeant. After the end of the war, his unit was sent to repatriate San Antonio and some of the western forts, and then to do border duty on the Rio Grande at a time when there were rumors that the ex-Confederates were regrouping in Mexico to charge back and retake the South. He arrived back in New Holstein in 1866 as a citizen with funds to begin a, a new life. He purchased a small farm, found a young German girl to marry, and started a family. He was undoubtedly influenced by his 1848er neighbors, but the immediate impetus for enlistment was likely financial and citizenship consideration. However, his loyalty to his new country was clearly displayed when he named his firstborn son George Washington Shore. The other great-grandparent uh, great was Jurgen Henrik Grill, who was born in, in Darwinworth near Marney in the Dittmarsh. He was only six years old at the, in uh, 1848, but old enough to be aware of the major events that were taking place. He immigrated in 1859 at the age of 17 by stowing away on one of the many ships going to New Orleans for a supply of cotton for the new power looms. Uh, after a landing, he worked his way up the Mississippi to Davenport, Iowa, where he hoped to establish a landing point for the rest of the family. When his brother Peter came in 1861, many of the southern ports were blockaded by the Union Navy. Uh, he had to come across country from the East Coast. Two years after that, the remaining family was not doing well in Germany. His mother had died, leaving his father to raise six small children. The King of Denmark was also dying and losing control of some of the outlying areas. And Bismarck was amassing, a ma uh, ma amassing troops <coughs> on the southern border to invade. Uh, there was intrigue and violence everywhere. And Jurgen decided to go back and bring the family out. <clears throat> he had not been here in this country long enough to become naturalized. So if the agents of either side had discovered him, he would have been immediately drafted into that army and may never have been able to make it, make it back to this country. He did get the family safety aboard a ship for the arduous trip to America. They landed in New York in 1863 at a time at the time of the draft riots and the military reaction to it. If you've ever seen the final sequences of the movie, The Gangs of New York, that was their reception to America. Uh, Jurgen did guide them pa uh, the family past the violence, past the recruiters for the army, past the recruiters for the immigrant sweatshops, and got them on a train west. They passed through Pennsylvania not long after General Lee had been pushed back from Gettysburg. The land was in Union hands, but it was not, complete, not really settled. Trains were convenient targets for a random gunfire. When they did make it to the peaceful par uh, prairies of Iowa, they were glad to settle down quietly. They had seen all of the violence that they wanted to see. Jurgen became a community leader and helped many of the later German immigrants with problems with local authorities, became a township trustee, and helped establish the local schools. So you see, not all of the German immigrants that were influenced by the Revolution of 1848 became involved in the Civil War. But they also did become solid and, re and, re and productive citizens. And with that, I'm gonna stop here. I think I used up my time. Yeah. Thank you. 
You can save some of those applause when I finished here, providing I get this technology started first. Uh, he told me this was real easy. I pushed this button, and there's gonna, something going to come with, and something that's going, and something is going to come with my name on it. Uh, he mentioned that I was a teacher, and teachers have a way of getting away from podiums. So if this is a type of briefing you had never seen before, and you're probably never going to invite me to your uh, campus today, is a very unorthodox briefing. I figured that you've been here for a long, long time, and you have heard all these facts, you have heard all these numbers, you have heard all these things coming your way. So what I'm going to do for you today is uh, I'm going to give you a a briefing my way. Uh, for those from Germany, you probably heard of Frank Sinatra. He said, I'm going to do it my way. Well, when I got up this morning, I said, I'm going to cry Joseph's way. And, uh, oh, yep. Stop right there for a second. Do anyone in here have any idea who this individual is before I just raise your hand. You don't, I'm not going to call on you and say, you answer that question. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is tell you that this is the person that I will be talking about. And uh, I put together seven little slides to tell you about the story about Frank Siegel. Now, I had all kinds of help from everybody in this audience, probably. And if Larry... <laughs> have never went first and let me went second, I will probably have my little seven slides up here waiting for you to tell you about Frank Siegel. So why, <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase this just shortly so I do not step over my uh, you, presentation here. You, you've got plenty of time. Okay. Uh, there was a theory that says, jo uh, Joseph, stop while you're ahead because these people that's gonna hear your presentation today want to know about Frank Siegel and not so much about Joseph. So if you will indulge with me, I would tell you a story about Frank Siegel because of the fact that hearing his story gave me an understanding of the 48ers. It gave me an understanding of the Civil War, and it gave me an understanding of why understanding Frank Siegel was someone that made me learn a little bit more about my heritage and to make me understand the importance of those Germans coming across the Atlantic Ocean and Frank Siegel coming across the Rhine. So if those of you that uh, looking for um, one of these traditional um, professor's briefing, you won't find it this morning. You will find it Joseph's way. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I dropped my name tag so everyone will say, oh, uh, he's not Joseph, but Terry did such a great job of letting everybody know it was me. We are here in this right place for those of you that says, oh, He's doing it his way instead of um, the, in accordance with the Wartburg College. But I got permission from Dan. Since he's not here, I can use his name. OK, this is the person that I'm going to tell you about today. And because of the fact that my good friend Larry told you all these facts, I am really going to have to um, improvise just a little bit because uh, he did a great way of introducing uh, the reason why I came here and to tell you why those uh, 48ers were so important to me. Well, now, for those of you that patiently waited until I finished my icebreaker, I will tell you about 108,000 is a conservative estimate for the number of the first generation immigrants from all the German countries who fought for the Union. 
The total have been recorded as a quarter million German immigrants was fighting on the side of the Union during the Civil War. What all the recorded estimates have in common is that many of the Germans counted with former Germans involved in the unsuccessful 1848 German Revolution. And you have heard many numbers thrown your way. I got these numbers from internet sources. I got these numbers from autobiographies. I got these numbers from primary sources. The reason why they fluctuate so, fluctuate so much is that there was no accurate way of counting all these people at this time. And as the revisionaries come and give us more important data, we come to realize that these number moves. So if those of you say, oh, Jesus, why did Joseph come up with 180,000 <laughs> crew, uh, German soldiers? It's because those numbers fluctuate. But during my research, I found that that was acceptable. When a country, for whatever reasons, loses a mass number of its citizens, oftentimes the receiving country gains from the acceptance of the new migrants. The United States benefited from the laborers, teachers, merchants, craftsmen, as well as leaders with uncompromising ideas. The intellects, the physicians, the journalists, the formers, reformers, and military personnel, especially the officers. This presentation will highlight how one such group helped influence the course of the American Civil War and achieved the vision of expansion of human freedom, which was impossible in the homeland of Germany. The German left their imprint and especially the estimated three to 4,000 immigrants called the 48ers from the Revolution Wave of 1848. One of the early historians and writer recorded, and her name was Eleanor Lund, author of the 48ers in the Civil War, gives an example of many such leaders. Lund mentioned the limited number of major generalship given in the Civil War, which contained only six allotted men of foreign birth and the Germans had over half of these leadership positions. So you can see the importance of the Germans' influence in the uh, Civil War. They was given half of those uh, leadership positions that was given out. The list included Karl Schultz, which most we, if you haven't heard of that name yet, you have been in the wrong location. Peter Ostenhausen. Franz Siegel, and the only 48er German uh, journal, which was Journal Adolf von Steigenveer. Steigenveer arrived in the United States in 1847 and served in the Mexican War. So therefore, he was not included in that group of the 1848s. The most controversial of these journals would be my good friend and hero, Major General Font Siegel. Thus, this presentation will focus on Siegel as an example of the impact the Germans and the German 48ers had on the American Revolution. I, I'm sorry, the American Civil War. Lund is one of the many authors who noted these high ranking military <coughs> appointments were political appointments and often came not only from previous military experience, but from the ability to rally the Germans to support the, Rep the Republican Party and the Union Army. Siegel was able to master the support before, during, and even after his departure from the Union Army. Who was Siegel? How did he summarize the vision of the 48ers? Equally important, why is Siegel often surrounded by so much controversy, even with his successful military re record in the German Revolution of 1848 and the American Civil War, and being first in the heart of his countrymen? Normally, a person that had achieved so much 
notoriety would be classified as a hero. Siegel and his excitement, a warning to end slavery, to bring the point home that the Germans was equally important as any other person on the soil. He was enthusiastic about his abilities. He knew what he could do. And this, of course, ran into a lot of situations with the West Pointers. This presentation would tell you, hopefully, that some of these facts was incorrect. And therefore, I will present to you, for those uh, in my German friends, Kapitel 1, or Chapter 1 of Siegel's Life Start with, the, with his birth in Sennheim, Baden in 1824. Siegel was raised in the liberal, liberal German state of Baden near the Black Forest. He graduated from Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe Military Academy in 1843 and was commissioned a lieutenant in the Baden Army. He soon became a leader of the Baden Revolutionary Force in 1848 and eventually the Minister of War. He was one of the few revolutionaries with military command experience. Why is that important? Because Siegel, when he crossed the Rhine, went to Switzerland, went to England, and found himself across the Atlantic, came with experience. And many times, and these research, uh, researches that I have come through, it was noted that Siegel was an inferior officer. That just was not the case. The academy in Karlsruhe, Germany, at that time, was equal to the West Point. That was brought to my attention not only from Stephen Engel, who did an excellent job on the autobiography of Franz Siegel. But all of my primary sources and all the archives that, and the newspapers that I was able to gather from Germany verify that important point. Why am I telling you this in this stage? It's because Siegel had credentials, and some of those things that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment, it's just not true. And after the defeat of the revolutionary by the Persian arm, army, Siegel led the retreat across the Rhine River into Switzerland, as I just noted. Later, he went to England and later migrated to the United States in 1852 as did many other German 48ers, we are now into the last days of our wonderful conference. Therefore, before all of you, and perhaps know this very important point, what you may not know is why the German 48ers coming to America was so important to me personally. By following and understanding the life of Siegel, allowed me to attend Würzburg College and both thanks the 49ers for their stand on slavery and their attempt to give you a reason why Siegel should be considered a hero instead of just one of the most misunderstood military leader in the Civil War. Now, some of the, some of the battles that Front Siegel experienced was, of course, uh, Wilson Creek, which most of you may be familiar with, the, uh, one of the early, early battles. The other battles are Pea Ridge, Second Manassas, and in the later battles, uh, uh, Antietam, Antietam, Fredericksburg, 
and the one that I will elaborate on is new market. This is to tell you how important this military leader was. And what, why I picked this person? Because he antipathies what the 48ers came to this United States for. The first battle is the battle at Cartridge. Had all the odds for fame stacked against it. It took place in the southwestern Missouri, far from the capital and centers, with big newspapers and reporters at hand. It was fought between pro Confederate Missouri State Guardsmen on the one side and predominant German Union volunteers on the other, and where Siegel earned great respect for the military skills. Actually, as far as the last point is concerned, two of the great authors, Heinz and Furham, argues that it wasn't why, and quote, while results, results can be man manipulated and debated, one thing remains clear. Cartridge was the first true battle victory for the Southern and one of the few successes in Missouri during the four bloody years of Missouri a military life, unquote. In face of all the arguments, Hines and Forham present one important point. One must still argue that the 48ers, Colonel Font Siegel, and his badly outnumbered and command inflicted higher casualties than any suffered themselves, and after a day of hard fighting, managed an orderly withdrawal. A very different maneuver, maneuver with highly untrained volunteers' troops and clearly something that General Irvin McDowell, for example, did not affect in Bull's Run. So I have to explain to you the difference in a person getting routed on a battlefield and a person that's an orderly retreat. Being an ex-soldier myself, I would tell you that sometimes you got to go and fight another day. And Siegel had this very important um, attribute. He knew that by splitting his, uh, his army at times, he could very well win a battle. Lee, General Lee is given a lot of credit for splitting his uh, troops and winning considerable amount of victories. However, when Siegel did this maneuver, he was greatly criticized. Why? Because he was not a West Pointer. If history would record it correctly, he actually had this idea about splitting the troops before a lot of the unions and a lot of Confederate soldiers decide to do that. Why are these battles so important? Because many of these battles here is one of some of the most bloody battles that was ever fought in the Civil War. In the retreat, in Wilson Creek, Siegel was tasked to bring his troop back to Roland. He did that very successful. Because he was successful, the army of the Union would live to fight another day. Now, I would like to tell you from the unorthodox way of teaching. For those of you that says, when is he going to get to his point? My point is this. I want it, uh, one of my forte is oral history. And I have a love for that. So I decided to make a trip down to Newmarket, where Siegel had his worst defeat. And I decided for this presentation, I would clarify and make some of these 
stories come to life. There was a regimental, uh, there was a unit called the Regimental of Slaves. It was called the 4th United States Color Infantry. And they were from 1863 to 1866. One of those brave men that served was Colonel, I'm sorry, Corporal Charles Veal of Company D. And he actually was born in Newmarket. The story of Siegel's skills, courage, and his dislike for slavery can be told from the ghost of his story who heard of this deed of Major General Franz Siegel. Some of the stories from the battle mentioned earlier involved can best be told from a point of view of a soldier who heard so much about this German officer who cared deeply about ending slavery and the establishment of more freedom for every person. Company Corporville had one important point that he wanted to bring out, and I wanted to tell you this from his point of view. One of the things that was told about the great defeat of Font Siegel was the fact that there was VMI cadets that beat a seasoned officer. Not true. The research from Stephen Ingalls and every credible resource that I was able to gather, and from walking the battlefields of Newmarket, I come to understand that those VMI cadets was available, but they did not go out to defeat General Siegel. And so, why is that important? That is important because stories like this has been told time and time again. And we come to understand that those important stories builds up. And what happens to the fact is that it makes those stories such as this a reality as well. Many printed resources accounts of how Siegel and the 48ers admired the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence and the founding fathers whom they considered to be a exemplary embodiment of Republican virtue. One such source is the Atlantic of July 1886. I found this to be very important. As noted in one of the earlier presentations in this very conference, Republicanism serve as the basis of political cooperation between the 48ers and the Republican Party. This is perhaps the greatest contribution that Siegel was able to offer the, uh, the Civil War. He influenced many Germans to join the Republican Party and help to get Abraham Lincoln elected. During the war, he was able to rally Germans to support the Union. And even when things was bleak in his military career, the cadence as one of my presenters said earlier, I fight Mitt Siegel, which according to Stephen Engel of the Yankee Dutchman, a biography of Frank Siegel was the rallying cry. It was not only the rallying cry of getting the Germans to go to the battlefield, it was the rallying cry also to get them to go to the voting booth and to get them to go to the voting booth in order to get Abraham Lincoln to get elected twice. Therefore, another major contribution to the Civil War and the freedom of the African Americans. Siegel, with that cadence, is, just, is not, is more than just a simple cadence of I fight Mitt Siegel. It was in broken German, for those of you that know that that is not the correct way of saying that in English. But the idea was Siegel was able to rally the troops. He was ready, able to rally the voters. And he was able to carry on the idea of the 48ers. Why was that important? Because that is not always toned told correctly, what is often told is the fact that 
Siegel was often given bad re reports from his um, officers to include General Grant himself. General Grant actually relieved Siegel after many, many times of not doing it the West Point way. And because he was relieved many times, history caught him unfavorably. Why? One example that I want to leave from, with you from Corporateville, as he tell it very well, is that one of the great generals of our time, General O. O. Howard, Oliver Otis Howard, was given a command where Siegel supposedly could not do. The result is that Howard could not could do no better job than Siegel. The point is, no matter how strong a general is, if you do not have the soldiers, if you do not have the communications, if you do not have the support of his superiors, it matters not. And for this important reason, Siegel was given many times a bad deal. And the story goes on, many other instances. But I think you get the point of what I'm trying to tell you here. And the point is, you have to look beyond these stories. And you have to look beyond and, and see the fact. Um, and I chose to give you not the numbers. I chose, not to give, I chose to give you a personal side of this life of Siegel. And I, by giving you a personal side, gave me an opportunity to tell you why this goes far beyond the numbers. In conclusion, Siegel was indeed a hero because his life story told the story of the Civil War with successes, failures, and the human feelings, a need to live out more beliefs. Authors and historians such as Ned Burford, Battle of the, and Leaders of the Civil War, James McPherson, Crossroad of Freedom at Atita, the battle that changed the course of the Civil War, where 6,000 soldiers was killed on the bloodiest single day of battle. As quoted by Lund in, his, in the presentation, it is with special things reading the outstanding research of Engel, who inspired me with his dissertation and biography of Frank, Frank Siegel. However, it was a person from this conference Daniel Nagel and his writing about slavery and having met with him to help me understand Siegel and thus understanding the 48ers and their impact of the Civil War to stress the need of the American society to conform and eventually eliminate slavery. And finally, my conclusion of my research and the writing and the reflection corresponded with the Welch Post of February the 13th, 1861, which stated, the 48ers and Dust Siegel, the German-American followers, added crucial votes to the Republican Party, which enabled the 48ers to gain influence and promote their belief that Southern slavery posed the greatest challenge to the perfection of the Republicanism, unquote. When the Civil War broke out, the 48ers welcomed the conflict and vigorously supported the cause of the Union because they were con convinced that a military struggle between the North and the South would lead to the abolishment of slavery and inch them a step closer to implementing the republicanism of freedom, equality, and thus why. I chose to present this briefing to you, or this presentation to you, this way. Because of Siegel, I'm able to stand in front of you and thank you.
next presenter is Amanda Wilson. Ms. Wilson earned her BA at Northwestern University. Good morning. Um, before I begin, I do want to offer a note of apology to anyone here who doesn't speak German. Um, the reason is I've decided not to translate the quotations that I take from the New Ulm Post into English uh, due to their um, offensiveness um, in reference to the Dakota people. I'm not comfortable taking ownership of the words that way, so I've chosen not to, but let's let it suffice to say that they're uh, fairly racist uh, to get the idea. Um, the connection of my paper to the revolutions of 1848 uh, is perhaps the most tentative of all at this conference. Uh, we've heard many biographies or touches thereon, and I don't have uh, a single name of a 48er in my paper. Uh, the connection relies simply on my focus on a small community founded by some of the men and women involved in the revolutions, namely New Ulm, Minnesota, founded or uh, incorporated in 1857. Uh, the founders of New Ulm conceived of the city as a place for German immigrants to escape from the pervasive nativism found in American cities and to preserve both the German language and their social and political ideologies. The 48ers had fought for political freedom and the freedom of the press in their native land, and they had developed a keen sense of the importance of the newspaper as a means of informing and educating a free citizenry. They recognized the newspaper as a seat of public knowledge, but the newspaper is more than that. It is an archive, both constructing and reflecting collective memory. It is with that in mind that I present the following. August of last year marked the sesquicentennial of the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, a six-week-long conflict in southwestern Minnesota, which was the result of many years of coercive economic and political relationships, attempts at forced acculturation, and broken treaties, to try to sum up a very complicated history in a few words. Uh, the war resulted in the hanging of 38 Dakota men on December 26, 1862 in Mankato, Minnesota. It remains the largest mass execution in the history of the United States. Born and raised in Mankato, John Buen, the director of the audio program at uh, Duke University, reflected in a recent radio program on how he had grown up oblivious to this part of his city's history. Quote, and the place where that hanging happened, it's right in the heart of downtown. I would have hung out at the mall not far from there, a few blocks down the street, and I would have ridden past that spot on my way to Pizza Hut with my buddies, who knows how many times, and never, it just never, I didn't hear about it, end quote. Somehow the hangings had been pushed out of Mankato's collective memory. The decision to hide this past may have been a conscious one. After the local, national, and international fascination with the war had died down, Minnesota boosters began to realize what kind of images of the state were being put out there with books, panoramas, and newspaper stories about the war. They asked themselves, quote, how will we encourage people to come to Minnesota if they think they're going to be scalped the minute they step out of their cabin, end quote. So many Minnesotans stopped talking about it. The production of these types of representations and presentations on the war subsided. The traces of this past were buried, and the community began to forget. The same forgetting that was evident in Mankato did not occur for the community of New Ulm, the site of two battles of the U.S. Dakota War. For the city of New Ulm, the war was a collective trauma and had and has a place in the collective memory of the community. The traces of the war in New Ulm have been archived in many different places. The Defenders Monument to those mostly German Americans who died in defense of the city, originally dedicated in 1891 and rededicated for the sesquicentennial, stands in a central location. The Junior Pioneers of New Ulm and the vicinity, a group of descendants of uh, the original German American residents of New Ulm, founded for the 50th anniversary, anniversary of the war, place historical markers around the area and organize commemorations. Personal accounts of captivity following the battles have been published. But the news media serve the construction of memory in ways that these traces do not. 
The specific temporality of the news media <coughs> creates a special relationship between the media and their audiences. The audience of the traditional archive is often indeterminate of future audience or multiple, multiple future audi audiences of unknown composition. The driving force behind the traditional archive is the desire to retrieve and preserve the traces, but not necessarily to present them to a specific audience. While a news medium may not know the full extent of the audience it reaches, it speaks both about a specific me uh, moment and to the audience of a specific moment. The earliest moment at which news medium in New Ulm spoke on the war was February 1864, when the, new, uh, when the newspaper The New Ulm Post opened its doors for the first time. In the following paper, I consider not the U.S. Dakota War itself, but how the New Ulm Post and its portrayal of the items related to the war in its first year of publication represented the collective memory of this, of this event for the community of New Ulm. Because the city occupied land formerly inhabited by the Dakota and the reservation was only 16 miles away, the Dakota had always been a part of the backdrop of New Ulm and consequently the representation of New Ulm in its papers. But in the beginning, the residents of New Ulm understood the Dakota to be disappearing. In the first issue of the New Ulm Pioneer, the predecessor of the Post, on January 1st, 1858, the editor wrote, quote, Einige Meilen weiter westlich und er befindet sich in der Wildnis mitten unter jenen rohen Söhne der Natur, deren trauriges Schicksal es geworden ist, zurückgedrängt von der äh, Zivilisation westlich und westlicher zu weichen, bis ihre Rasse am großen Weltmeer verschwindet. Although the Dakota remained a presence in the area, restricted to living on a small reservation along the Minnesota River, but often traveling to or through New Ulm to conduct a business, the trope of the vanishing but not yet vanished Indian legitimated European American inhabitants of the land. But by the time the New Ulm Post was founded six years later, the Dakota's fate of disappearance was not as certain. At least what did seem certain to European American inhabitants of New Ulm was that the Dakota would not go quietly and they felt the threat of their own disappearance at the, hands of the, the <coughs> excuse me, at the hands of the Dakota looming over them. This was the mindset that framed the local audience's reception of the Post's report relating to the U.S. Dakota War and its aftermath. The news implies the current, but the pioneer could not present the events of the U.S. Dakota War when they were current. In the two battles of New Ulm on August 19th and August 23rd, 1862, Dakota soldiers raised the town, burning down more than a third of the buildings, including the office of the Pioneer. The editor of the Pioneer, Givet Autobart, was also killed in the flames. New Ulm was without a local newspaper for 18 months before the New Ulm Post first appeared. In each issue of the Post in the first year of publication, the editors featured from one to five items related to the U.S. Dakota War and its aftermath. All of these items, whether explicitly or not, are involved in looking back at the war. This relationship with the past is what established the role of the new own post in constructing the collective memory of the war. In the post, the editor expressed a different understanding of the Dakota's uh, role in the new own community than had been established in the Pioneer. In the first issue of the Post, a celebratory article appeared reporting the capture of the Dakota Chief's Little Six and Medicine Bottle. And a quick note that for the Dakota, I do use their anglicized names to reflect how they were written in the post. Appealing to the anger of the community, the writer accused Little Six of being Anna de Blutigsten Würger, allegedly having murdered 13 white women and roasted a number of infants in ovens. He declared, Wir können gern froh sein, froh sein wenn wir hören, dass die rote Bestie am Galgen verendet. Although the capture occurred illegally in British territory north of the Minnesota border, the report is in the local section of the post. The continued military actions against the Dakota, the manhunt, and the punitive expeditions were carried out outside of Minnesota, but it was a part of the continued saga. As a defining moment in the identity of New Ulm, the war and all, the, all that came after were a part of the community's collective memory. This violence had been written in. Thus, as a keeper and constructor of collective memory, the Post identified the importance of such pieces to the community and therefore framed them as local news. In their article, Collective Memory and the News, Kurt and Gladys Engelang explain the necessity of the use and adaptation of collective memory through the presentation of news media with the concept of public agenda. They posit public agenda as the counterpart of collective memory. 
Lang and Lang explain, quote, an agenda embodies an orientation to the future, collective memory towards the past, end quote. Like collective memory, the public agenda may and will change over time. Because the newspaper issue has a one-time presentation to its target audience, it needs to be right for that moment, and each successive issue will need to be right for the successive moment. Long and long go on further to state, quote, we can begin to restore the original clarity to the concept of public agenda by restricting it to issues or problems that mandate some resolution or response and uh, by reviving the concept of collective memory to refer to the public awareness of a common past, end quote. The implication of this statement for the coverage of the U.S. Dakota War and its aftermath in the new Ulm Post years after the end of the war is that the effects on the community required some response. The memories of the war haunted the residents of New Ulm. The war had rocked their sense of security and hence the sense of their future. The coverage of the U.S. Dakota War and its aftermath in the New Ulm Post was therefore a method by which the community could attempt to build and process its collective memory while also establishing a public agenda for its future. The progression from collective memory to public agenda is clear in some of the ways the writers of the New Ulm Post utilized the stories related to the war. For example, Chief Little Crow, the reluctant leader of the Dakota forces during the war, had been shot and killed by a settler outside of Hutchinson, Minnesota on July 3, 1863. Eight months later, in the second issue of the paper, a report on the killing appeared in the New Ulm Post. The report names the settler and congratulates him for both his luck and bravery and discusses the bounty put on Little Crow's head. The, uh, the bounty amounted to $500, but the writer explains, Ein Tausend für den Erleger der furchtbaren Bestie Little Crow für einen Mann, dessen Name in der Geschichte des Nordwestens schwerlich vergessen werden wird, wäre sicher nicht zu viel gemessen. The writer puts this in incident into greater context. While describing the debate that occurred following the death of Little Crow as to whether $1,000 would have been a more proper bounty than $500, he also describes the meager pay given to U.S. soldiers and argues that better pay would bring the military to a size as would guarantee the security of the state. The fear engendered by the memory of the U.S. Dakota War thus fed the demand for greater financial support for security. While neither the writer nor the designers of financial part, uh, policy could change the past outcome of the war, the painful memory drove the demand for future change. In the wake of the war, fear had a constant presence in the psyche of the residents of New Ulm. Although the majority of the Dakota had been expelled from Minnesota in March 1863, the war had made palpable the fear that American Indians would escape from the reservations to wreak revenge. In a short report in the Post, one writer caught readers' attentions with the headline, They're Coming Back. He wrote, Sie kommen wieder, doch erschrecken nicht Leser, sie kommen alle wieder, nämlich die alten Settler hier und im, in Umgegend. Instead of announcing the return of Dakota soldiers, he reported the return of eight families that had fled the area following the attack on New Ulm. The Post also reported that uh, the fear had risen to such a level that locals were crying wolf and Scandinavians with walking sticks were being taken for belligerent Indians with bows and arrows. The writer praised the dedicated watchfulness of the population but commanded, nur nicht ängstlich. By using such methods and discussing such topics, the Post brought attention to the collective emotional consequences of the war but also suggested the need, need to move beyond such fear. In addition to ideas on recovery and fear, the New Ulm Post uh, related stories of triumph over the Dakota. Reports from the punitive expeditions of former Governor Henry Sibley and General uh, Alfred Sully made regular appearances in the Post. Although the exact number of casualties in the battles uh, for the Dakota are unknown, the Post stressed, der Verlust der Indianer an Toten ist bedeutend unser gering. Uh, the defeat of the Dakota on different stages became such a regular part of the report that deaths of the Dakota were included but no longer emphasized. In September of 1864, one writer reported, In betreff der Indianer liegen keine weitere Nachrichten von Bedeutung vor. However, in the following lines, he clarified that two Indians had been killed in their attempts to escape transport to Fort Randall. In another issue, the Post also gleefully reported the sorry state of a group of women imprisoned in a camp below Fort Snelling. The women lived in teepees patched together from discarded army tents. The writer excitedly explained that one of the women had been identified as 
einer der letzten Zuwächse zu Little Crow's Harem. Uh, even this woman, as a member of the company, the writer stated, <coughs> aber selbst die Schönheit unter ihnen würde noch lange kein passendes Modell zu einem Standbild der Pocahontas abgeben. While also speculating that the shawls the women wrapped themselves with were perhaps taken off white victims of the war, the writer divorced these Dakota from any romanticized notion of the American Indian. In these reports, the suffering of the, of the Dakota was something to relish. They signaled the shape of the future relationship between the residents of New Ulm and the Dakota. No longer simply a neighboring curiosity, the Dakota were something for the people of New Ulm to fight and despise. And although the Post supported President Lincoln in the majority of his undertakings, it complained of his reprieve of many of uh, the Dakota allegedly involved in the war. Man vermag sich kaum die unbegreifliche Milde zu erklären, mit welcher der Präsident in dieser Angelegenheit verfahren ist und noch verfährt. In the August 12, 1864 issue of the New Ulm Post, within a week of the second anniversary of the beginning of the U.S. Dakota War, the local section featured four articles relating to the war. While always reflecting and constructing collective memory, these articles address the past and future in different ways. Jill A. Eady divides the types of stories that journalists tell about the past into three categories, commemoration, historical analogies, and historical context. She argues that a distinguishing characteristic of commemorative journalism is that the pieces in this category, quote, typically do not attempt to connect the past to the present in meaningful ways, end quote. Commemorative journalism therefore engages with collective memory, but does not make the leap from collective memory to public agenda. One of the August 12th articles took on this relationship to the past. Es gibt sowohl im Leben ganze Nationen als einzelne Gemeinschaften Momente, deren lebhafte Erinnerung oft nach Jahrhunderten besonderer Tage entweder der lauten Freude und Fröhlichkeit oder wehmütiger Betrachtungen und ernster Gefühle geweiht sind. Sie werden von vor allem den Mannen derjenigen, die in Verteidigung des häuslichen Heeres gefallen sind, den Tribut ehrenden Andenkens zollen. This commemoration acknowledged the importance of the civilians and militiamen who fell in the two battles of New Ulm to the community's past and expressed the hope for continued peace, but the connection to the present and future of the community otherwise was weak. Two of the other pieces once again echoed the persisting fear. One announced rumors of Indians in the area and advised, Waffen und Munition sind hinreichende Menge vorhanden und es ist zur Komplettierung der Bewaffung noch einer Partie Springfield Rifles unterwegs. Another accused an at-large band of Dakota of crimes against settlers. Viele Einwander sind getötet und vieles Vieh gestohlen worden. These two items describe a continuity of the emotional toll of the war, but the final item explicitly brings a past pain into relation with public agenda. This item falls into Edie's final category of historical context. The author of 1862 und 1864 describes, Und heute, da die meisten unserer alten äh, geflüchteten Settler wieder zu ihrer Heimstätte zurückgekehrt sind, heute nach zwei Jahren fühlen sich die meisten noch nicht sicher, in dem kleinere äh, Bande von Indianern herumschleichen und zu stehlen und zu morden. But he went on to explain the context of his frustration. In 1863, due to rising demand for manpower and a shortage of voluntary enlistments, the U.S. government began a national conscription program. The author of this article complained that as the government took young Minnesota men to fight uh, in the war between the Union and the Confederacy, it left the borders of Minnesota inadequately guarded by too few and impotent soldiers. A threat that Minnesotans regarded yet as very current was no longer a priority for the U.S. military. The author exclaimed, Zwei Jahre und die Gräueltaten der Rothäute sind bei den Herrn Leaders vergessen. Zwei Jahre und schon darf der Soldat nicht erlauben, die Hand für weniger die Waffe gegen einen aufgefangenen Mörder erheben. By challenging the draft, the author took up the collective memory of the U.S. Dakota War in order to contextualize the public agenda. Through the act of archiving or interpreting, recording, and presenting the past, the news media contribute to the formation of collective memory. 
In turn, that collective memory shapes public agenda. By the time the new Ulm Post opened its doors, the U.S. Dakota War of 1862 was already one and a half years in the past. But by uh, continuing to present the war, its aftermath, and related materials to its audience, the Post played a role in shaping the present and future relationship of its public to those events. The U.S. Dakota War is still extant in the collective memory of the uh, city of New Ulm. Of course, for the Dakota too, the memory of the trauma remains to an even greater extent. Uh, the Dakota's collective memory and public agenda were not reflected <coughs> or constructed by news media coverage, however, as their primary means of communication historically was oral, not written. But they were uh, constructed and expressed through other sites of memory, other types of archives. Journalism is intertextual. It is one among many sites of uh, memory construction and does not exist independently of these. The immediacy of the presentation of the news media and the size of the audiences that majority news organs are able to reach allow them to play significant roles in the construction of collective memory for the near future. The fact that the war has remained in the collective memory of these groups beyond the then near future attests both to the extent of the effects of the war, uh, the effects the war had on each community, and to the potency of other sources of collective memory construction. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, uh, and and so if we have any, we will start with those. I have a mic that I can take around so that if you have a question, raise it, raise your hand, and and I will bring this around. And if the the person to whom the question is directed could use the the podium here, there will be at least a microfilm, microphone microphone on both ends. I see a question up here. And for whom is the question? Uh, that would be for... Uh, I, um, nice paper, I really enjoyed that. And what I kind of wanted to ask about is, um, I know yesterday evening you could talk with Chris about the quotation question, how to deal with the racist language, and. You made the statement again today about you wanted to make sure that you used the words of the time because you didn't want to misconstrue or deal with this language problem, racism. And my question really is, is this a, do you see this as a language that is used just in this area because as, a, as racist, as problematic, or is this a modern perception that this is a racist, problematic language? And associate with that then, do papers say in German newspapers in New York or in Germany itself use a similar language where it's, it is just that you say things like red-skinned people for Native Americans at this point in time in Germany? Um, well, I think uh, the, the greater problems I have I, I mean, I'm personally not comfortable saying redskin, but um, there are other terms used in the paper that I'm less um, comfortable with, like calling them uh, beasts and things like that. And you do see um, a difference in uh, some of the language from before the war and after the war. Uh, the, there's more of a violence in after the war, which to some degree makes sense. Um, before the war, when you're describe, when they're describing uh, American Indians, it's more the innocent little nature people and um, things like that, which have their own issues. Um, I think a large problem for me with the vocabulary comes also from um, working in a, a museum and a historic site where um, we're trying to be very sensitive to some of these things and what I was thinking about, one of the things I was thinking about when I was writing this paper is if um, a Dakota person was reading this, they might not have the, the same uh, reaction to it that I do uh, coming from a German studies program and just trying to be more conscious of um, 
putting that extra distance between myself and the words by not translating it. Because when we translate, of course, we're making the final decisions. You can directly translate some things, but not everything. And so you do need to take ownership of the words to some extent. And while I can say, yes, I, it's, it's not my, they aren't my words. Um, and they are the words of the time, more or less. I, I just feel far more comfortable leaving them in the original so that I can keep that maintained distance between me and any terms. I do acknowledge, however, that that makes it less accessible to people who don't speak the language. We have another question. For whom is the question directed? Um, I found some newspaper accounts directed at uh, the Hessian soldiers during the Revolutionary War that make these pale in comparison and description. And the question is, do we then avoid all uh, racial or ethnic epithets in our own language because of a sensitivity? And I mean, this is far worse than what you just read. I mean, they were warning your children to be locked up. They're going to bayonet babies. And this is in the 1700s in an area where, surprisingly, the Moravians had uh, Christianized the Native Americans so that they spoke German. So it's kind of a weird sense to me. and I. I it's okay in one ethnic sense, and that's, I'm very sensitive to that, being a German-American, in the sense that even now, if you watch um, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, have you seen the Hessian soldier portrayed? There seems to be no sensitivity there. So my question is, you know, is it a local sensitivity, do you think, to um, an ethnic epithet, or do you think it's universal, nationwide, perhaps? Uh, well, I think, my own perspective, I think we could all probably stand to be more sensitive. Um, one of the reactions that I had specifically to this is also because, um, you know, I'm not from Minnesota. I'm very distanced from this history. I understand at the same time that I grew up in an area that was at one time acquired more or less through force from a, a different group of American Indians. So I can't totally distance myself from that history. Um, but at the same time, I'm a little shocked um, when I have met people from New Ulm who are, are descendants of some of the original founders and things like that, and the terminology that they continue to use for these people, um, which, you know, there's a, an extreme emotion there that I'm totally disconnected from. Um, at the same time, I, th I think it's a, a level of unnecessary violence, um, especially too uh, when we're talking about the Dakota and we use terms like the Sioux. That's a term that literally means enemy. It was given by another group of people and um, for the to calling the war the Sioux uprising by saying uprising instead of war, we're denying um, that they were a sovereign nation and treated as such for much of our history with them, um, but not for a long time. So I, you know, I think there are things that we're all unaware of. Last uh, winter, I was lucky enough to get a trip to Hawaii for Christmas. And um, at the same time, I realized, well, our culture has totally appropriated Native Hawaiian culture to an extent where it's kitschy and fun and I enjoy it. And I also realized that it, that is another kind of violence to Native Hawaiians. Um, who essentially have been, um, again, made the innocent natives so that we could feel less bad about taking some of their things from them. And the same has been done over time uh, when Benjamin Franklin was talking about who belonged in this country, why uh, there should be not just no slaves, but no African Americans, period. He said that only the whites and the reds belonged here, and of course, Germans were not considered white by him. Uh, so very, very complicated. You're referring to that letter that Franklin wrote in 1751, saying that all these dark-skinned, guttural-speaking people need to go back. But then, in contrast, the, referring to the Germans, that he really was not very friendly to them. However, you fast forward a few years, he's up in Pennsylvania with the Moravians, who were German, from, uh, and he loved them. Mm -hmm. They were just absolutely wonderful. So you got to take it in context. We had. I think another question here. Pardon? Okay. Well, well, 
uh, we'll ask the general question. Yeah, I'm not a specialist of this uh, history, but I'm just uh, uh, puzzled. Many uh, German 48, uh, 1848ers very was influenced by the socialistic uh, ideology based on the uh, dialectical materialism based on class analysis. But American uh, abolitionist civil war is a very much Christian evangelical progressive, eh? progressivism based on the racism. So any 48 has uh, some ideological, philosophical difficulty working with abolitionism based on Christian progressivism. Can anybody can? And is there anyone who'd like a shot at that, at responding to that question? As, as someone who's not an expert in the 48ers, I won't try to do so. And I'm, we, we may leave that for other conversation. I see another hand over here. And your comment is for, or a question, is for Amanda. This is uh, perhaps a more contemporary question, but in view of your sensitivities that you've been talking about, should the Washington Redskins change their name? Uh, I mean, I personally think yes, but I understand that's a, a contested issue for a lot of reasons, and I don't personally have any stock in it. But I ultimately, if you know, I were God, I would say, yeah, <laughs> we change it. Um, but you know, to some extent, too we have to ask the communities that are actually involved in that, and I'm not a part of any related community to that. Um, even when, we're, when I'm using terms of for the Native peoples here, I make the conscious decision to say American Indian instead of Native American or things like that because um, I'm aware of survey work that has been done that says that is the preferred term by Native peoples, but that doesn't mean that everybody prefers that term, and um, so it's, you know, it's kind of a toss-up. You're going to please some and not everyone. I tried to do the best I can. And we've got a comment or a question. Well, sort of, I guess, one or the other. Uh, you you're <coughs> earlier referred to the uh, New Alm had a celebration last year of the 150th anniversary of the uh, uprising. And one of the interesting things about that is a week-long celebration and uh, the uh, Indian presence that was involved there involved the uh, uh, Dakota tribes or Dakota units that were not involved in the massacre or the uprising in 1862. The Indians that were involved in that had been shipped out to Iowa and then to Dakota and then end up on the Santee Reservation in Northeast Nebraska. But when the celebration came up, they were never invited to participate. And uh, I wrote, several letters to people in New Alm and to people in the Santee Reservation saying there should be some more cooperation after 150 years. But uh, apparently there's still some anxiety there yet about uh, what groups were involved and what weren't and who did what and where. And so it's not an entirely settled issue yet even after 150 years. You know, and I, I don't know the details of that, but I know of a project um, at the Minnesota Historical Society where they put together an exhibit for the sesquicentennial where they, um, in the attempt to not claim authority because they also themselves have a problematic history um, or a pro problematic relationship to this history, they invited different groups of people to come in and comment on their prototype of the exhibit. And so they invited um, descendants of people who were from Brown County. Um, they invited um, Dakota and they invited museum professionals. And one of the difficulties was actually getting Dakota people in for a couple different reasons. Partly a, a mistrust of that type of institution because of the way it's um, related to them over the years. Um, but also there is an intense divide within the Dakota community because it was only a, a fraction of the, the Dakota that were actually involved in supporting this war. So I, I know a woman who her uh, grandfather decided not to be involved and uh, his brother decided to be involved and there's a still family fights. So, you know, the reason that we're in the situation we are now is because 
you, uh, you know, wanted to go to war, and the uh, response is, well, you didn't want to do anything, and this was probably going to happen to us anyway. So it might be um, partly also internal to the Dakota community. Are there other questions? Yes, I got a, a follow-up to what you had said, and I really struggle. It seems to me that you use the the phrase about, you know, the own people having still some reservations and whatever. When we think about terms that are used historically or whatever, shouldn't we today in contemporary terms consider the context, the environment, or how the, you know, the term is being used and take that into consideration and not link it to something in the past or it it seems that we're making sometimes uh, we're making changes that are linked to something that happened way back then but and omitting or not taking into account the current circumstances in which the term is being used and many times in a very positive encouraging and you know way not derogatory in any sense I think that's, I mean, I see your point, but I think that's also a question of audience to who is that still a positive, or to who is that a positive thing and to who is it perhaps less so. And I, I think that um, speaking about what context it's being used in, um, at the same time, I think it, it's a tragic to see the extent sometimes, maybe not in this circumstance, I'm, make, I'm not making that claim, but um, the extent to which we divorce something from its historical context. And I was reading a piece, I was speaking with one of the presenters who's in the other panel right now um, about um, talking about slavery in public history museums and historic sites and things like that. And the argument of this author was that um, it was written in the 90s uh, during the Clinton administration, and he was saying all of these race debates and discussions on race that we're trying to have right now um, can't happen because the majority of the public is uneducated as to African American history in this country, and so we need to bring that back in, not just to schools, but into uh, public history sites in meaningful ways. And I, my reaction to that was that that's all well and great and people really don't have the context for these debates, but um, in museums, I don't think it's necessarily by making people aware of the loss of context, you're gonna move immediately to these really intelligent discussions on race, but uh, it's, it's a, at least something we can do to bring back some of the awareness of to where these things did come from and that to some groups, they're still meaningful in that way. So maybe not to me as a, you know, a white middle class woman, but to other people I might be interacting with. Another question here, and for whom is your question? Also the subject, the subject is interesting. Uh, I struggle with that because I have the feeling that historians are the purveyor of uh, truths, of the interpretation of the truths, and if you uh, in my opinion, falsified with oversensitivity, then we are not receiving what happened 150 years ago. I mean, people thought that way, and we have to get to know what, how the people thought in that at that time. Yeah, and I I, I agree. Um, you know, we need to understand the context of what they were living in. Um, I also. Um, any claims to truth I find problematic because what it, what is the truth? I mean, any written source essentially is an interpretation of something that traveled through someone's brain somehow. Um, so I think there are a lot of, of layers that we have to consider and it's, it's not just linguistic, it's not just you know historical events, it's a lot of different things. One more question up here. Very, very Thank good. you. And for whom is your question? <laughs> and I mean, on some level, I kind of was, while he gets up, make a comment on it. I mean, this whole thing that she's talking about, I mean, we have it in the South all the time still with the un re unreconstructed Confederates still. So, I mean, you have it everywhere. And those people still use language of secession, slavery, and their 
conversation. But for Joseph, I, um, kind of an intriguing paper. But the one thing I wanted to ask you is, um, you said that VMI units at New Market, you don't feel like they are the responsible ones for um, Siegel's defeat, if I understood you correctly. That is correct, yes. Can you explain now why you would say that we shouldn't think of Siegel's defeat at New Market as a defeat? Uh, it was clear that Brig and Ridge uh, had an upper hand at New Market. What is not clear in all of my research is, and that's what grow me, uh, one of the things that grow me to a New Market uh, because I learned a lot about Frank Siegel from uh, Engel was the fact that um, I could not believe that a man of this intelligence, a man of this uh, uh, virtue and, and his superior uh, knowledge could be defeated by a bunch of uh, red, uh, green um, cadets. And at that very wall, that's, that very monument that's at the uh, New Market, it states that the uh, VMI uh, cadets were in fact trained, but they were not called up to defeat uh, Siegel. And that is a true point. They were uh, part, but they were not as um, prevalent as recorded in a lots of these uh, history books. Yes, Peter. Uh, I'm trying to say uh, 1862, I believe. There's an account of the VMI uh, cadets being marched into battle totally unprepared, yes. and being slaughtered, but I, I gotta tell you, the memory isn't working on that battle. I have no clue. <laughs> uh, and for you, uh, Peter, is it Peter? Or no? It's, you got it right, Joe. Uh, yes, Peter. Uh, for you, uh, I have uh, the very document that I would hand over to you, because it's uh, right there in my, in my booklet. I will okay. hand that to you and my gift to you with, uh, because I do respect the uh, VMI. They do have a gr very high uh, tradition, but they did not defeat that well, journal. Also, they're attached to Stonewall Jackson's coattails because he was a teacher there. And I, I, think, I think you're right in many ways. Siegel's whole attack was, was very political. And we're never made aware historically of the stuff that was bubbling under the surface of who wanted to be promoted, who had to look good, and you know, so, good point. And Peter, just to uh, follow up on that, um, because many of the historians as well hobble on this point, uh, Siegel was more than just a political pony. It is a fact that Abraham Lincoln was owing to uh, Siegel and Carl Schultz, and Siegel got him a lot of those voters, but let me tell you, he was not, uh, Siegel was not only a, a great educator, he was not only a smart lawyer because his dad was a lawyer, and when he got frustrated with the revolution, he actually resigned and was going to Heidelberg to become a lawyer, but he was convinced to go back and fulfill his role as a military leader. And he was also a great journalist after the uh, Civil War. So I don't want to get into all those uh, things that he did uh, beyond the Civil War, but uh, he was a very well-educated man. Do we have time for one last question? It is uh, perhaps more a small a story to tell I live in Freiburg, in Germany, in Baden, and um, uh, I lived there uh, about uh, one uh, kilometer uh, away from a place where um, a small battle took place with Franz Siegel. It was in uh, April 1848, the Baden uprising, and um, it is uh, something very interesting for me that there was a monument for the soldiers 
of um, not of the democratic uprisings, but um, from um, the soldiers of um, um, it is uh, uh, die Schwaben, we say, Baden-Württemberg. Uh, Schwaben, perhaps somebody can help me. Swa uh, Swabish. Swab is uh, the Swabians, yes. And uh, uh, there was a big struggle be between the uh, Baden people and the uh, Swaben, Swaben or, uh, people. They stood at, uh, on different sides. And the uh, um, uh, Schwabish people uh, were the representatives of um, authoritarian uh, uh, side, yes. But 2003, um, after an initiative of uh, people there in Freiburg, a monument was placed there to remember Siegel and the people who fought there uh, with him. And it took, so you can see, quite a lot of time in Germany uh, to uh, remember this 48er there fighting there in April 1848 for democracy. Thank you. Maybe it's a closing remark, but maybe it would be nice to know that in the township immediately south of New Alm, it's called Siegel, was named in 1866 in honor of this general. Thank you. I will make a point when I go to Deutschland uh, <laughs> to uh, go to that location because uh, I, uh, Siegel is uh, a hero of mine. Thank you. I, I, and I'm not sure that, I, I, well, I don't think I've ever heard that Siegel had a township named after him in, in that area. We have at least one county in Iowa named after a 48er, uh, Kosuth the Hungarian. And I'm not sure how many counties in the United States may be named after. 48ers. I'm sure a relatively small number, and I feel compelled to point out that you're in the only county in the United States, Bremer County, named after a Swede. Frederica Bremer. Terry, if I could just mention just one last point on Siegel. In, in New York, where he, the place he entered, they have monuments and they have streets named from him. And of course in St. Louis, uh, they have a monument for him as well. So the U.S people are uh, citizen, they get it right. They just don't tell the story correctly <laughs> in full details. Thank you. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, it, it's been a good session, and if you have additional questions, I'm sure they'd be willing to answer them afterwards. Thanks.